Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. 150 grams of paperwork to fly a 377 gram drone. Yes, that's what it took and many, many hours of work to be able to fly my DJI Avada 2 drone at the Canadian Tank Museum's recent tank exhibitions. Sure, I could have flown my Mini 4 Pro with no special authorizations, but I really wanted to get that FPV view of chasing tanks around the arena. So let's go through the steps to help you understand what you need to do to fly in similar circumstances with lots of secrets for success along the way. Call me lucky, almost all of my regular drone flights are in Class G airspace. So for me, this was the first time I had to do an SFOC, my first serious nav drone authorization, and even the first DJI unlock I've done in a very long time. I may not have done everything right this time, or perhaps not the most efficient way, but I figured I could pass along my learnings to you guys. Just so you understand the context of my operation, I had been invited to capture aerial footage at the Aquino Tank Weekend at the Canadian Tank Museum in Oshawa, Ontario. This exhibition was one of several tank events presented at the museum over the course of the summer, and they're incredibly cool with tank combat demos and battle reenactments and the ability to get right up and personal with the gear. If you've never visited the museum, I would encourage you to check it out. This is a Canadian gem, the largest collection of operational armored vehicles in North America. The tank weekends are advertised events with thousands of visitors each day. As a result, I needed an SFOC Special Flight Operations Certificate to fly there. In addition, the museum is located immediately adjacent to the Oshawa Executive Airport, CYOO, right here, just a few hundred meters from the two runways. And there's a Class D control zone covering the whole area. In fact, the Nav Canada control tower looms large beside the tank arena field. And of course, being this close to a major airport, the DJI FlySafe system classifies it as a red restricted zone, requiring a custom unlock. So let's walk through the steps required to fly here. The first and toughest step is to get an SFOC approved. Applying for an SFOC is required whenever you want to fly your drone in some circumstance beyond the normal rules for basic or advanced operations. And one of those circumstances is flying a drone over 250 grams at an advertised event like this one. You apply for an SFOC from the Transport Canada Drone Safety webpage. There's a link in the description below this video. Now, Transport Canada differentiates between high risk operations, such as flying beyond visual line of sight, and low risk operations. For the high risk operations, you need to have an advanced pilot certificate and you need to complete a complete SORA, a specific operational risk assessment. But thankfully, flying at an advertised event is considered a lower risk operation, and the required documentation is, well, slightly less onerous. And you can have either a basic or advanced pilot certificate. In the case of the lower risk SFOCs, you'll be required to submit at least three documents, the completed SFOC application form itself, the completed compliance checklist specific to the type of operation, whether it be an advertised event, flying over 400 feet or whatever. And finally, a supporting document or documents covering all the details answering the requirements of the compliance checklist. And that's where most of the work lies. Let's go through each one of these. The SFOC application form is the same form regardless of what your type of operation is. And it's not too bad. It's two pages and covers the basics. Who's applying, the type of operation, a bit of high-level information about the operation, and lists of drones, pilots, and other crew members. And also a signature. This form is a PDF, and I recommend you download it, then use the free Adobe Acrobat Fill and Sign tool to fill out the form. And that allows you to include your e-signature. This is much easier than printing it, filling it in, signing, and scanning the whole thing. The next step is to download a compliance checklist. Again, not a big deal. Just find your type of operation, such as advertised event, 
and click Request a Copy. You fill in the little document requester form and you immediately receive an email with yet another link which you click and finally get to download the compliance checklist document, which is a .doc file editable in MS Word. There's slightly different checklists for each type of SFOC, so be sure to grab the right one. And in my opinion, calling it a checklist is a bit of a misnomer because each one is really a set of specific questions that you need to answer and answer in a convincing way. In the case of the advertised event checklist, there are 19 questions to answer. So what I did was open an MS Word document and typed out an answer for each question in a separate section, with each section header matching the numbering scheme in the compliance checklist. For example, the first item is to describe in detail the purpose of the RPAS operation at an advertised event, including the number of expected people, if a secured slash fenced area, if controlled airspace or restricted, CYR, etc. Yeah, that's the way it's worded. I wrote a blurb of about a page long describing the event and where it was. Now, most of these sections were pretty straightforward, and for several, I simply referenced Drone Pilot Canada, such as for where maintenance records were being stored. But I'll point out four key questions that you should pay particular attention to. First, you'll need some sort of document from the event organizer indicating that you are working with them and you're not just some random dude at the event. In my case, I wrote a short invitation blurb and asked the museum director to send it back to me in an email and then included a snip of that email in my support document. Second, they want a safety plan. So I identified three key risk areas, spectators, event crew, and manned aircraft, and described how I was mitigating the risk to each one. Now, in some cases, it was a bit laughable. The risk of my tiny 377 gram drone to spectators was pretty small compared to the risk of a 60 ton tank racing around 50 feet from them, separated by a chain link fence. But I just played it straight and wrote on an answer. My safety plan answer was about a page long. The third item to focus on is the site survey. Now, of course, I generated a site survey from Drone Pilot Canada, and that was really easy, and so I included that as a separate document. But I also put two annotated maps into the support document to help portray further details more clearly. And this was tricky because I had never been to one of these tank events before, so how it played out and where things were happening was new to me. I could probably have done a better job on this area, frankly, but I guess it was okay in the end. The last point I wanted to highlight was the request for proof of valid liability insurance. Now, I was covered by this specific event's insurance itself, but this requirement is something to be aware of well in advance when you're planning your operation. So in the end, my supporting document was 10 pages long, plus the five page site survey from Drone Pilot Canada. And it probably took me anywhere from 10 to 12 hours to prepare in total. The TC inspector approving my submission did commend me on it and said, quote, very well prepared SFOC application. It took only 11 calendar days to receive full approval, which was pretty fast. I was very happy to see it approved. It was a lot of work. 150 grams of paper for a 377 gram drone to fly around 60 ton tanks. Well, kind of funny, but worth it. But that was just the first of four levels of authorization required. Number two was nav drone authorization, since I was, well, smack dab in the middle of a class D control zone. Not surprisingly, manual authorization was required. So I submitted my requests 10 days in advance. Now, I don't use nav drone very often, so it took me a while to figure out even simple stuff, like how to close off the polygon to describe my flight area, but I managed to get through it. I specified my maximum altitude to be 21 meters and added the SFOC approval number in the notes, and those little details probably helped. And I had to do it three times, since nav drone requests 
can't be longer than a day each. And I was at the event three days. There is a duplicate um, operation button, thankfully. But I have to say it, the nav drone tool, even on the PC, is appallingly unintuitive. And it didn't even seem to be working half the time. I feel sorry for people who have to use it regularly. I don't even have any tips to offer you. Sorry, I just stumbled through the best I could. By the way, I did the flight authorization request only for the Avada 2, not the Mini 4 Pro, since the Mini 4 Pro is below 250 grams and doesn't need authorization. By comparison, the third level of authorization was a breeze, and it really isn't authorization, just coordination with the airport. I had contacted the airport operations team during a previous visit to the tank museum using the OPR contact number in Drone Pilot Canada. From that earlier contact, I already had email addresses for the key people. They quickly acknowledged my flight plan, and that was that. Easy, polite, and sensible. Then we get to the DJI Unlock, the final step in the process. Since the tank museum is so close to the airport, DJI has designated the area a red or restricted zone in their FlySafe GeoZone system, meaning it requires a manual custom unlock. And in order to get a custom unlock, you need documentation showing that you are actually authorized to fly in that specific location. So I could only get the unlock after I had both the SFOC and nav drone requests approved. Once I had those approvals, I immediately requested a custom unlock on the DJI FlySafe webpage. Well, I goofed up a few times with the dates and location, and this is important to know. Your DJI request has to exactly match the authorizations. They actually check this stuff. But I received accepted custom unlocks eventually after I got through my mistakes. If I had done it right the first time, it would have taken only a few minutes end to end. I imported the licenses into both the Mini 4 Pro and Avada 2 about a week before the event, and I figured I was made in the shade. But surprise! On site, the morning of the tank weekend event, I discovered that the unlocks didn't work, and it turned out to be entirely my own fault. I didn't realize that you had to turn on the licenses in addition to importing them. I was totally stumped, and frankly, I was sh bricks. But the DJI helpline was incredible and got me through this step. Now, it's a bit hidden in my opinion, and, and it's new since the last time I had done an unlock. Briefly, you have to go to the GeoZone Unlock screen on the DJI Fly app. It's under the Profile and Settings. Select the Unlock License from the list. On the next screen, there are now two tabs at the top, Account Unlocking Licenses and Aircraft Unlocking Licenses. It was the aircraft unlocking part that I had completely missed. With your drone connected, you can then tap on that tab, the aircraft unlocking licenses, then tap on the license and you'll see a map of your unlock area. Uh, and by the way, I took these screenshots after the fact, so ignore the not within valid period message here. You can then tap the switch to turn on the license. You'll be asked to confirm two conditions of responsibility. And once you agree to these, your license will be turned on. Thankfully, both drones started up immediately after turning on their licenses. I'm sure this step is obvious to anyone who has done an unlock before, but for me, it was totally baffling. And if I hadn't solved this, I would not have been able to fly either drone at the event. They wouldn't take off. And then there was one more catch. On the Avada 2, you need to physically connect your phone to the goggles every single time you power on the drone so that it can reconfirm the unlock license. What a pain! I actually asked DJI support if this was required and they quickly confirmed it, but they did say they would suggest some improvement to the development team. This was only on the Avada 2, not on the Mini 4 Pro. I guess the Mini 4 Pro's controller automatically checks that the unlock is okay, but the Avada 2 cannot do that without a phone connection. That certainly made battery swaps an ordeal. My spotter and I worked like a Formula One pit crew every time I needed to swap batteries during filming. So there we have it. The process to legally and well physically fly in a very complex environment and some magical tips to get you through. I hope you found this video helpful. If so, 
hit that like button and comment down below. Thanks for watching.